Здравствуйте, я очень рад посетить Санкт-Петербург. Hello, it's a pleasure for me to visit St. Petersburg. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in the beautiful city of uh, St. Petersburg. And um, I'd like to talk about non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so you've probably seen curves like this already where lung cancer is by far the most common disease that we deal with when it comes to mortality. These are data from the United States, but it will look very similar if you look at Europe and probably Russia as well. So when we talk about immunotherapy, the impact of immunotherapy, arguably one of the most effective treatments in a long time, will primarily be felt for lung cancer, I think. Melanoma data, obviously wonderful, but I think the numbers clearly favor impact on non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I think you've already heard a little bit about the history of immunotherapy, and it all goes back to a surgeon uh, in New York City, uh, William Coley, who actually was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he injected actually bacteria into tumors, and sometimes these tumors would actually go away. And this was arguably the first immunotherapy uh, more than 125 years ago, and the New York Times, which is a, you know, a, a major newspaper, said 150 sure cures, you know. Uh, I sometimes wonder what I've been doing wrong in my last uh, 20 years treating cancer, uh, but certainly immunotherapy has come a long way. Uh, you've seen a similar picture already, you know, going back to Coley, 125 years forward. But I think it's really important to say it's not a linear progression, as you've seen before. Um, it was shown that really for a long time there was very, very little progress. We had failures after failures with immunotherapy, but with the introduction of checkpoint blockade, that would be CTLA-4 and PD-1 therapies, we are now at a tipping point where suddenly <coughs> immunotherapy looks extremely promising. And just to demonstrate this a little bit more, there's a large number of papers now out suggesting strong benefit and leading to multiple approvals with immunotherapy. And you know, one of my colleagues in, uh, in, in LA has said, you know, the field of immunotherapy has exploded in the last decade and more and more patients are benefiting. And I think that's true, um, where we see suddenly an entire ASCO meeting all being about immunotherapy in some way. Um, there's no single talk that does not mention immunotherapy. Science in 2013 said the breakthrough of the year is cancer immunotherapy. And I would actually argue that probably science is getting this wrong. It's probably the breakthrough of the decade or the breakthrough of the century. Um, and as Dr. Nikita said, I think there will be at least one Nobel Prize for immunotherapy. You know? That being said, um, let's talk about cancer or lung cancer specifically. So we talked about the introduction. Let's talk a little bit about clinical data, updates from the recent <coughs> ASCO meeting, and then I'll, I'll conclude and I'll try to stay on time. So this is the cancer immunotherapy cycle that I think you already had a very elegant uh, introduction by Dr. Markle. Um, you can see here a tumor that will express certain antigens that might be visible to the immune system. Those could be neoantigens related to mutations or maybe viral antigens. Um, these are potentially, uh, you know, taken up and then presented by dendritic cells. These are recognized in the lymph node. And then in a perfect world, a trained T cell would go back to the tumor and start killing the tumor. That's how it should be. However, unfortunately, there are many, many ways that tumor cells can escape the immune system. And we are just starting to realize that these breaks are probably the key to retraining or reactivating the immune system. And that's what checkpoint blockers do. There's many other ways of doing it. But checkpoint blockade with PD-1 agents, with CTLA-4, um, and potentially many others, do exactly that. They reactivate T cells that otherwise um, have been told to back off or not attack the tumor. And here's what we oftentimes call an inflamed tumor. This is actually a squamous cell tumor that was stained in my laboratory. Red uh, is tumor, is um, uh, cytokeratin staining. Uh, blue are nuclei, uh, nuclei. And in green, you actually see CD8 positive cells. And on the left, you see an inflamed tumor. So this tumor is visible to the immune system. However, this tumor probably expresses high levels of immune escape uh, markers, checkpoints, immune checkpoints. And if you treat this with a checkpoint inhibitor, there's a high chance that suddenly you take down the camouflage, you take down the hiding from the tumor and make the tumor again visible to the immune system. And that's where I think we see the activity in tumors at a high level of tumor inflammation, high levels of expression of PDL1 and other checkpoint uh, markers. On the right hand side, though, you see another tumor that has no inflammation. And potentially that's much more challenging. How do you turn a non inflamed tumor into an inflamed tumor? This is a concept that one of my colleagues. Uh, Tom Gajewski has probably advanced, and I think that's really the challenge. How do you change this into this? So now let's look at uh, the agents that we're talking about more from a clinical perspective. We have two PD-1 agents that have been approved in multiple cancer types, 
Pembrol is a map and nivolumab. These are approved in lung cancer, melanoma, and kidney cancer. There's also many other agents in development, for example, PDL1 agents such as atizolizumab, davalumab, avalumab. And then there's two CTLA4 agents here at the bottom. And as was already alluded to, CTLA4 agents have a very different profile. They have arguably less activity um, and they have potentially more toxicity, but they might still be very important, maybe as combination partners. And I'll get to that towards the end of my talk. So now I want to start with a case report of a non-small cell lung cancer patient. This is a 62-year-old gentleman, uh, 40 years uh, of smoking, has a metastatic squamous cell cancer. The patient is treated with four cycles of doublet chemotherapy, um, carboplatin, paclitaxel. Unfortunately, as so often is the case, uh, the patient eventually progresses, but then still has actually a good performance status and actually does get one of those biomarker assays that Dr. Nikita was just talking about. He gets a PDL1 assay. Um, in this case with uh, the, the 22C3 antibody and has 90% expression on the tumor cells and is felt to be PDL1 positive. So in this setting, which of the following options, at least in the United States right now, would be most appropriate, would you recommend for this patient? And the answer as of today is one of the PD-1 inhibitors, so either pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And I want to show you the data that would actually lead to this recommendation. I know that these agents are not yet approved in Russia and in many other countries, but I think this is just the beginning and I think we'll see data forthcoming that will support that, not just in lung cancer, but also in many other cancer types. So let's start out with nivolumab, which actually has the first data in, 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 in lung cancer. There are two large phase three studies that were presented at last year's ASCO meeting. The squamous trial is called Checkmate 17. The non-squamous trial or adenocarcinoma trial is called Checkmate 57. Both trials were strongly positive. These are the data for Checkmate 17 squamous cell tumors, a hazard ratio of 0.62. This is second line treatment in comparison to docetaxel, so PD-1 inhibition versus docetaxel. And you can see rather striking results with a good hazard ratio and an improvement in median overall survival by more than three months. These were arguably the more striking data for Checkmate 57. The trial was also positive with a hazard ratio of 0.73. Again, uh, nivolumab outperforming uh, docetaxel as a second uh, line agent. Uh, again, a survival benefit of three months and a good hazard ratio. However, when we talk about response rate, the response rate is actually not that good. The response rate in this nivolumab trial was actually only 19%. But then you see these rather striking survival data. And I think it shows you one of the characteristics of immunotherapy. These agents work primarily on survival. They make patients live longer. They don't necessarily lead to patients responding that often. Many patients have stable disease for extended periods of time, uh, and that's likely why we see the primary impact of immunotherapy is on survival. This is very different from what we see with chemotherapy, with targeted therapies, where we oftentimes see a PFS benefit or responses, but very little impact on survival. These agents do exactly what we want, which is make patients live longer. Um, and the one other thing that's really important about these agents is that these agents oftentimes lead to durable responses. So if you look at the median time of response on this trial, for chemotherapy it was five months. For nivolumab, it was triple that. It was 17 months. And this is true in general for immunotherapy. This is true for CTLA-4 agents. This is true for pembrolizumab. These agents have a unique characteristic as they make patients not just live longer, but the patients who have benefit have arguably very, very major benefit with, dur with durable responses. So um, very briefly, you've already seen uh, PD-1 as a biomarker, so I won't spend much time on this. But the other agent, which is pembrolizumab, uh, the agent made, made by MSD, was also evaluated in non-small cell lung cancer. These were the early data with Keynote 0, 0, 0, uh, 001. And you can see on the left side the response rate stratified by expression of PDL1. And you can see here that PDL1 is able to show, uh, to enrich patients for a much higher benefit rate. So patients with more than 50% had about a 40% response rate, which is more than double of what you've seen otherwise. And you can see here patients who have less expression still have benefit, but the benefit is substantially lower. This is also borne out in the survival data. You can see here in blue, patients with high expression levels of PDL1 have outstanding survival. And the other characteristics about these survival curves is a stabilization at the end of the tail um, where patients have long-term benefit. And again, this is very similar to what was already shown, for example, for epilumab in melanoma. And we see this also in lung cancer. 
Now there's also a phase three study with pembrolizumab. This is essentially the equivalent uh, trial to the trials from, uh, from nivolumab. This is Keynote 010 or Keynote 10. Again, a PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab versus docetaxel. This, however, is a trial that enriches patients um, for PD-1 positivity, so those patients had arguably more benefit. At the time, it wasn't clear which dose of pembrolizumab was optimal. It turned out that it's exactly the same, um, but that's why there's three arms here, pembrolizumab at 2 milligrams per kg, 10 milligrams per kg versus dose of taxol. And the results, when you look at the biomarker, for, mo for more than 50% are rather striking, you know, an unbelievably good hazard ratio of 0.5 and compare in favor of the immunotherapy for both dose levels. You can see very similar survival for both dose levels and far superior to second-line chemotherapy. So this really justifies second-line use for both agents, uh, for both PD-1 agents. And clearly, if you want to enrich for those patients who have the most benefit, this is a strategy that can enrich for mo those patients who have more benefit. And also keep in mind, you know, in the United States, often Oftentimes these agents are given somewhat indiscriminately, but if you have a limited amount of, um, of, of supply or financial ability to pay for these agents, this might be a way to potentially give those agents to those patients who have the most benefit. Um, there's also data actually for the lower stratum at 1%. Here you still have a good hazard ratio of uh, 0.7 or 0.6, depending on how you look at it. But again, the benefit is more pronounced in, at 50% and somewhat uh, less pronounced at 1%, but still striking and significant. So I think it depends on where you set the cutoff, depending on the level of benefit. This is also borne out by response rate, response of 30% versus 18%, as you can see here in this phase three trial. When you look at the so-called forest plot, um, one thing that I want to point out there is benefit across the board, but arguably the one category of patients that do not benefit that much or uh, meaningfully from uh, uh, PD-1 blockade uh, are the EGFR mutant patients. So those are patients who have more stable genetic features, they have less mutational burden, and potentially these patients have less benefit, and maybe you should use these agents more sparingly or later in later lines of therapy. This is true for Keynote 10 with pembrolizumab. This is also true for nivolumab in the Checkmate studies. Um, again, here the Checkmate data, very similar. In EGFR mutant patients, there's no benefit, as you can see here in the forest plot. What about first-line therapy? So we had data already that was kind of intriguing from the early phase one expansion cohort of Keynote 1. You can see here in patients in the first-line treatment setting, patients with high expression levels of uh, PDL1 had outstanding survival. You know, how does this look in metastatic lung cancer? This looks really, really good. Um, and this ultimately led to a phase three study, and this literally just came out uh, a week ago, June 16th. This is a Keynote 24 study. We don't have the details of the results, but this is a first-line study demonstrating superior progression-free survival and overall survival in comparison to first-line chemotherapy in patients who have active uh, expression of pdl one And we look forward to seeing, uh, you know, the more detailed results at one of the upcoming meetings. What about side effects? In general, and this is the other remarkable thing about immunotherapy, PD-1 agents are very well tolerated. You can see here the comparison of a PD-1 inhibitor uh, versus chemotherapy on all accounts usually, and especially when you look at neutropenia or grade 3, the higher toxicities, PD-1 agents are very well tolerated. You know, some of my patients will say, Dr. Zyvert, I, I really don't mind getting the treatment. Uh, what I really mind is coming to a clinic and waiting an hour and having to park and all these things. Um, in general, these agents are very well tolerated and provide good quality of life. There are, however, some side effects that are specific to, to the immune mechanism. We call those immune-mediated adverse events or immune-related side effects. And the one thing that I really would like to point out, there's one toxicity with PD-1 that you have to watch out for, and that is pneumonitis. That is essentially when the immune system becomes too strong and attacks the lung, and this can potentially be life-threatening. We have learned over time that pneumonitis has to be screened for. It is manageable if you treat it uh, quickly and aggressively with steroids, but it is very important that those one to two percent, so it's not common, of patients who develop pneumonitis have to be treated quickly. All the other toxicities are relatively uncommon. Uh, thyroid toxicity are common, but they're relatively easy to manage just by supplementing with uh, levothyroxine. 
Um, this is a timing. Usually it's within the first 14 weeks that these side effects occur, although it is not always predictable uh, based on the timing. And I just wanted to show you a quick case of a lung cancer patient. Here you see the lung cancer. Had a beautiful response, but by six months developed these diffuse opacities. This is pneumonitis. This patient had to come off treatment um, and was treated with steroids. However, the interesting thing is that even though you take off a patient off from therapy, you give immunosuppressive therapy, oftentimes the treatment effect actually continues and persists. So there's some differential between side effects and actually main effect against the cancer. Here is a patient who has a little bit of a rash. Rash is relatively common. Sometimes it's fleeting. Uh, and that can be managed oftentimes with topical therapies or just observation. The other thing I would like to point out, and I don't know if this was mentioned already, but there's this so-called phenomena of pseudoprogression or a tumor flare. And this is unique for immunotherapy. This is actually a case with epilumab, so a CTLA-4 antibody, and a melanoma patient. The patient was treated with his treatment at Sloan Kettering, then actually developed at 12 weeks substantially increase in the tumor lesions. However, this was likely a beginning immune response, and then at 20 weeks there was regression, and then eventually uh, a really complete regression and a complete response. But one thing to keep in mind is for PD-1 agents for lung cancer, this is very rare. This happens quite commonly with ipilimumab in melanoma, but for PD-1 agents in lung cancer, it is quite uncommon. It's very, very important. So if you have somebody who actually has growing disease, relatively quickly growing disease, you should not keep the patient on because this is potentially a patient who might die from their disease unless they get some other treatment. So pseudoprogression does occur, tumor flares do occur, but they're relatively uncommon. I would estimate only one out of 20 patients who has, S uh, who has progressive disease does have one of those pseudoprogressions. There are potentially ways to find out, uh, but always keep in mind that the treatment effect of immunotherapy is long lasting, so even if you take off a patient, that effect will potentially persist. Uh, and this is essentially the mechanism where you see rapid influx of immune cells, so it actually looks bigger even though the tumor is actually eventually regressing. The other thing I would like to point out is there are agents both against PD-1, uh, the receptor, as well as the ligand PD-L1. But there are some slight differences. And I wanted to point this out because we actually don't exactly know that they are the same or how they actually um, should be used. So this is PD-1 on the immune cell. This is PD-L1 on the tumor cell or on a macrophage. However, PD-1 also interacts with PD-L2. And as you heard before, PD-L2 is commonly overexpressed also on tumor cells. Um, PD-L1 actually also binds to a different receptor, B7.1. And, you know, this part is somewhat less understood, but clearly uh, we should keep in mind that these agents are not exactly the same, although oftentimes clinically they look uh, somewhat similar. So here's some data uh, with a PD-L1 agent. This is tezolizumab from Genentech Roche, uh, randomized phase two study. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but also good efficacy here by both response and also by uh, 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 survival. Um, the other thing, again, is you can enrich for benefit using this biomarker. So Roche, just like Merck, used the enrichment strategy to find out those patients who have the most benefit from immunotherapy by using a PD-L1 assay. Um, Davalumab is another agent, a PDL1 agent, and this is oftentimes used in combination with a CTLA4 agent. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, um, but again, you see durable benefit. However, when you add CTLA4, oftentimes you substantially increase the side effect profile, and you can see this here. There's a lot more diarrhea, which is usually uncommon with PD1 agents. Uh, CTLA4 agents have a very typical side effect of diarrhea and colitis, and that needs to be treated oftentimes. What about biomarkers? We already talked about PDL1. There are also new biomarkers in development. This is an assay actually associated with Davalumab treatment, looking at interferon gamma, measuring directly in fresh tissue. And you can see you can enrich if you combine interferon gamma with uh, PDL1 up to a positive predictive value of 46%. So that's very, very good. Um, looks better than PDL1 by itself. And also, you actually potentially have the ability to really rule out this patient that clearly don't have benefit. So negative predictive value of 97 percent uh, is also quite good. There's another essay being developed as a PDL1 signature, and this will likely become available soon. This is an essay developed by Merck using the so-called nanostring platform, and I'm quite excited about this. This is uh, a signature, so it's more robust and can be used on paraffin and bedded tissue. 
So finally, I also wanted to mention briefly what I already alluded to. You can also look at mutational load uh, as a potential biomarker. Patients with more mutations tend to do better, and oftentimes that also correlates with tobacco use. Tobacco induces many, many mutations. It's like a cluster bomb that leads to many mutations across the board, and more mutations does benefit, uh, does lead to potentially more, um, you know, winning lottery tickets that could potentially lead to an immune response. However, I would like to point out that mutations are not perfect. And using it overall uh, may correlate with benefit, but for an individual patient, we currently don't measure mutational burden. Unless you have a very high mutational burden, um, it is more of a research essay right now. Um, I wanted to briefly mention there's activity in small cell lung cancer, another smoking-associated tumor, again, both with pembrolizumab and nivolumab. There's activity in mesothelioma, a disease that I also treat. Uh, these are data from the Keynote 28 study. Um, and here's a quick uh, example, really impressive response of a mesothelioma that you see here that then shrinks at eight weeks and at 16 weeks. Um, and there are currently ongoing phase three studies also for mesothelioma, um, I think, with both PD-1 agents. Um, what is next? What does the future hold? Um, I think we will um, go into the first line setting. You already saw data for Keynote uh, 24. Um, we are going to see combination agents and also combination with chemotherapy. And just as a teaser, I wanted to show you two data points from uh, ASCO 2016. These are actually first line treatment setting of pembrolizumab, a PD-1 antibody in combination with chemotherapy. There are three different types of chemotherapy. This was combined with uh, carbotaxel, carbotaxel plus bevacizumab and pemetrexate carboplatin. The response rates are striking on the order of uh, you know, 52 to more than 70 percent. These are response rates certainly superior to what we see with chemotherapy alone, where it would be like 30, 40 percent. So really striking synergy by response. But also when you look at, uh, at survival, these agents look quite good. We're talking about metastatic lung cancer, overall survival with a leveling off at about 60 months. I mean, these data are somewhat uh, immature, small data sets, but certainly very, very encouraging. Uh, and this has led to two phase three studies here uh, in non-squamous tumors with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, 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 carbo uh, pemetrexate, and then also with, uh, in, in squamous tumors with um, Paclitaxel and, uh, uh, and a carboplatin. So I think um, these strategies for the first line setting could be enrichment for PDR1, but it might also be that, especially for patients who are PDR1 negative, there might be benefit of using PD1 blockade in combination with chemotherapy. The other data point that was very interesting at uh, ASCO 2016 was that BMS is pursuing a different strategy uh, combining uh, with CTLA-4, and these data also look good, um, you know, substantial response rate between 39% and 47%. Um, initially, there were data that were very concerning for toxicity in the early days, combining uh, two high doses of ipilimumab, but at this newer dose level, actually, this does seem to be um, uh, uh, quite tolerable, um, and I think, again, we have to wait. These are small numbers, and we have to look at the survival data, but certainly, um, looks encouraging as well. So we have at least two strategies going forward, either combining with chemotherapy or combination with CTLA-4. Finally, I wanted to show you the guidelines and just to show you this is the standard of care now in the United States already. Um, it's a, uh, for second line treatment, it's a category one, so the highest level of recommendation in the second line setting is a PD-1 inhibitor, either pembrolizumab or nivolumab. This is true for, uh, for adenocarcinomas and it is also true uh, for squamous cell tumors. And with that, I would like to conclude. Immunotherapy is clearly active in lung cancer, and I think it's really a watershed moment, I think, not just for lung cancer, but for many cancer types. Um, the impact, and this is really important, when you look at response rate, it underestimates benefits. These drugs are primarily impacting overall survival. Patients do live longer with these agents. Even in patients that don't seem to have response, survival is oftentimes extended, and that's really, really meaningful, especially when you look at prolonged stable disease. Um, the responses can be deep and durable, and the durability of responses is also a very important characteristic of immunotherapy. However, we clearly have to do better also because some patients do develop resistance, so I think there's much to come. You know, when we first discovered the estrogen receptor, we had 10, 15 years of progress uh, using anti-estrogen therapy. The same will happen for immunotherapy. This is a watershed moment, I think, in the treatment of lung cancer, but I think the next 5, 10 years will lead to many, uh, much more progress. I think we have to uh, keep in mind that these agents are very well tolerated. However, 
ex uh, severe side effects such as pneumonitis and colitis can occur. They're uncommon, but they have to be treated very quickly. Keep in mind that atypical responses can occur. You know, it's literally a balance between the immune system and uh, the cancer. And sometimes that balance goes back and forth, so we don't see the always reliable pattern that we see with chemotherapy. So it's a bit different. And as long as you're aware of that, it's actually very, uh, uh, very manageable. PDL1 as a biomarker right now is the best biomarker we have. It enriches for patients with benefit. Certainly, if you have a first line patient, that might be helpful. Or if you really want to allocate treatment to those patients who have the most benefit, that might currently be the best uh, way of doing it. In addition, new biomarkers are forthcoming. And then finally, what I find exciting, we are looking already at combinations. A second wave of immunotherapy is starting. That could be in combination with chemotherapy or in combination with other immunotherapies. And I think the future is really uh, bright and you know, it's very humbling to be at this point in time. So with that, I would like to finish. And you know, this is Chicago. This is usually where ASCO is. This is where the University of Chicago is. And I would like to thank my many colleagues who have contributed to this. Thank you for your attention.